Hello everyone, um, this video is sponsored by Wargaming and we're talking about augmented reality and how to use it for the military because Nicholas Morin here is also a veteran. Yep, this is a sponsored video. Let's be upfront about it. Yeah, we're but like. I like to think that we actually do have something fairly unique to offer. And uh, the, this is a technology demonstrator that we're using for a game, but the, the applications for augmented reality are huge in, the, in, in real life, although they do also come with some detriments. Can you basically explain the system, how it's now in place? Because I actually only saw it on the side, so I don't even know okay. it. So all, all you do is you need to have a point of reference around which the computer will generate a three-dimensional world that you can walk around. So, so basically like you have the North Pole where everything is oriented around. Correct. So you aim at, in this case, is a small little square in the middle. Uh, it's only about yay big, so you can put it on your desk, or you can put it on the side of a tank, you can put it wherever. And uh, it will generate now, in this oh, 3D cool. world, that you can walk around. Here, go ahead and drive. Okay, that's, so we're, that's we're really cool. These... I also see the car in the background. That's it awesome. is, and you can have somebody standing about. But it doesn't matter if there's anybody in the back or not. I mean, it looks cool. Yeah. But what that's... we now have is you have a completely three-dimensioned uh, render of the beach at, uh, at D-Day. So we have tanks coming off the landing craft. Again, this is all uh, dramatic for entertainment purposes. Yeah. But just imagine how, how quickly this sort of technology can be converted. Yeah, I mean, this is the, to give us a basic idea about your military background. Could you introduce what, what you did and right. because... So I'm a tanker by trade, if you don't know it. Uh, I'm 19 years now with the uh, Army National Guard, being a tanker, being a cavalryman, uh, although I've been driving a desk the last few years. And uh, I'm also, as you can tell with Wargaming, I'm, I like to think I'm relatively up to speed with modern technology as well. People think I'm World War II, but I'm, I'm modern by preference. So, so in ranks and, and units you commanded, to give uh, us a basic idea. I am idea. currently a major, I, as, at time of writing, hopefully. And uh, I've commanded a cavalry troop, uh, that's the only command I've actually had. But I've been XO of a tank, uh, platoon, a tank company, leader of a tank platoon and uh, operations officer for a couple of different units as well. But uh, the thing about this AR though is that you, you're, you're just holding it still like it's a TV. The whole thing about an, a, an augmented reality, a three-dimensional vision like this, is you can get around, you can get into all sorts of angles, all sorts of new uh, perspectives on things. So let's say you have a 3D model of some terrain that you're about to fight on. Yeah. One of the first things you do when engagement area development, if you can, is you get in your truck or your Humvee and you go to the far end and you see what the terrain looks like from the attacker's yeah. perspective. With this, you just walk around. And turn it around, yeah. And, and you now have this three-dimensional terrain. You know exactly what's happening. And, and of course, also, there's probably application of video games as well yeah. for, uh, you know, for war games, even just you know, uh, computer war games. This is going to be a great thing. Instead of having to go to each other's house with models, you just do it on this. I mean, I think General Mattis is known for that. He had this Lego command that he, I think, had a one Lego thing for every tank and every unit and everything. And then he put it on a huge sand area they built or something. So basically, you can do this now with that and you don't have to use scanned images or a scanned satellite footage and yeah. create the landscape basically out of, from scratch. So let's move on to, oh, just uh, Whitman. we'll call it Whitman. It's, it's sort of not actually a reenactment. It's, it's just, not Willis Bocage? No, it is not Ville Bocage. It, it is quite simply, uh, as we go past, so this is just an introduction scene. We can, we can skip past this. But um, there, there are sort of two perspectives where you can use augmented reality, I think, at, the, at this point in the military. But again, so uh, just for looking at the model, as, as you scan around, you get the different perspectives. Uh, one is at the tactical level, when you're in the tank or whatever and you're trying to use augmented reality to fight better. The other is at the planning level, where you're trying to use augmented reality to plan better. And I, my personal opinion, one is going to be better more suited than the other. So as, as I said, for example, with EA development, so if we step back here, what we have now is, you can see it's just a huge field yeah. with a battle happening. And again, this is World of Tanks, so we have things a little bit closer than real life. Uh, if you have a UAV overhead, maybe you could even use this for an after-action review. Find out yeah. what on earth happened uh, it's at NTC, for example, at a training center. Do you think it should, could or should be used, for instance, 
in a tank you're rather blind nowadays or still rather blind well isn't that a question to be asked so what what, what would be the potential but also the risks to a certain degree because i mean if the input data is a, is is not complete then you have the problem that you think there's nothing there but actually there's somebody well, that's part of it so again so remember i said you had the, the options between tactical and planning so there is a version of augmented reality now being uh, developed by let's say the israelis i think they call it uh, iron vision mm. which uh, you're inside wearing a headset that you can see your tank controls and so on but it can also by use of cameras on the outside of the tank you can look around as if your armor was clear glass and you can see what is around you that way. Interesting idea. Another possibility is uh, people have been talking about let's give a drone to a tank platoon. Yeah, off goes the drone. Things that you think it's a great idea. And if you especially have uh, a drone, so maybe two drones, and you use uh, photometry with multiple lenses, you can create a 3D image just like that. Fantastic. And then you can fly around within this AR world without having to actually fly the drone. Great in theory, but here's the, here's the problem you have, is that you can only do so much at once. There's only so much you can process, process at once. Yeah. What, what, is, what really makes a tank unit effective, if you think about it? What, I mean, why were the Panzers so effective in 1940 in France? Coordination. Coordina that's one thing, and? Uh, communications. Well, but yeah, that, that's, that's, coordination that's coordination to a certain degree. Speed. Speed, yeah. The, the so basically you're going back to the OODA loop. Basically. The OODA loop by John Boyd. It is basically an abstraction of a combat operation process that is followed by actors in combat. First observe, then orient themselves, then decide and finally act. Now whoever can perform this process faster might overwhelm the enemy, depending on the discrepancy. I think one of the best examples for this is the Battle of France, where the Wehrmacht repeatedly outplayed the French that were just overwhelmed and paralyzed most of the time due to the operational speed. So what, what, what the experiments have discovered is that soldiers who have all this access to all the reconnaissance assets in the world... You get sensory UAVs, overload? You won't do anything without checking first. We're, we're going to attack across this hill. Okay, let's send the drone out and we'll have a look. And okay, yeah, it looks clear, and we and we move forward. So basically, you you lose initiative and a certain amount of aggression. Correct. Yeah, you that's you can see the problem. You yeah. have to trust other units are doing their job that the reconnaissance units have cleared. Uh, I mean, a recon unit. Okay, they might have a little bit more time to sit there and maybe throw the odd drone. Yeah. A, a tank unit shouldn't. A tank unit should be. We are going that way. We're going to hit them hard. We're going to punch through, and then we're going to keep going before they have time to react. If you go one one hill crest forward, and then you stop and check, and then you go another hill crest forward, and if you are seen at any point in this, the opposition is going to have a lovely reception for you at the far end. It's possible that you will see it mm -hmm. because you got the drones and all that, and, and and you have all this wonderful vision. But what that means is that you are stopped because you're not going forward. If you were stopped because you were dead versus if you were stopped because you were just too slow, okay, yeah, it's good for you, you're not dead, but have you actually, in the long run, incurred more losses because now you have a fortified position that you gotta somehow punch through? I mean, a other problem I could also see, are basically the one is sensory overload, and the other would be, you basically the US Army for, for most of the parts for, for mainly countries that were not up to scratch in technology or opponents. Yes. I mean, they were not all the countries. So, but if you suddenly pinned against someone who has capabilities to shoot down your drones, to, to distort your, your communication and other aspects that you basically have a lot of people that are fully trained on augmented reality but suddenly can't deal without it anymore. This could also be a problem. There, there ha that has been a problem as well, yes. And uh, as, as I said, so at, the, at the higher level, at the planning level, usually you have a little bit more time to think. Yeah, on the planning level, I don't see very much of a problem. I'm thinking more like really going in a tactical level, then, or real time basically. Then I'm, I'm more like, okay, sensory overload and all the other stuff. Because even in the training, you are, not, you are less stressed than during a combat situation, I assume. Right, and, and it can still... Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's just a little bit of a showpiece here. Well, it gets a little bit more interesting further on, I think. Um, so, 
that's not to say that it can't be done real time, but the problem is I don't think that it's going to be possible. I mean, imagine playing a turn-based game like this, and you plot your orders, and just, I mean, I've gone completely off the military for a second. But it is possible to have a real-time assessment, but it has to be somebody whose sole function it is yeah, I was to do this. About it. So basically you have to do a new kind of general staff. Well, I mean, not, not general staff on that level, but like the Germans or the Prussians basically at one point realized, okay, we can't handle this anymore, so we need a general staff. And at this time, you basically need an augmented reality stuff because there's more and more information to process. Quite possibly. So we, I mean, we now put EW, electronic warfare officers, in. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that you will have to have a... a it will probably be part of the S2 function, honestly, the intelligence function that does the maps and, and so on. I was thinking about it because in intelligence, the real part is dissemination that you just put out the information that is necessary because you get usually way too right. much. And this is basically what I see here. You get way too much information and then you probably will turn it down for the troops depending on the level how much information they actually see. And that's one of the things a lot of people forget about intelligence. They think that data coming in is intelligence. It's not. No. And the S2 will that's, always hammer you for this. Raw, raw data. It's raw data you and only once it's been processed and analyzed does it become intelligence. Yeah. And meantime it's basically information then intelligence. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what you knowledge. need to know. You don't need the raw data when you're a tanker. Yeah. You just need what, of all that information, what do I need to know now? And it is possible that AR could be maybe transmitted through the Iron, uh, the Iron Vision system by somebody else that says, hey, over here, big red arrow from yeah. God saying, you want to check this out or something like that. So that will be a tactical application in the tank. But it's not going to be the guy in the tank flying the drone around, creating the 3D image for him and then assessing it himself. Yeah. That is probably a bad idea. So and you pr probably would also like, you have really good graphics here, you probably would turn it down to like an infantryman is just a red stick figure to a certain degree because you then you're, also, you, you, you're not getting overloaded, you see okay this is clearly the enemy and maybe his posture or something, yeah. but, but what weapon, okay weapon could also be an issue what he's holding because <laughs> if he's a machine gun or an anti-tank weapon of course yes. it's different. But like, like many other details, like the camouflage or helmet is mostly irrelevant. You will strip it away. So basically you would hide certain amounts of information and also depending on the command level, I assume, that just everyone gets the information he needs. That's the theory. Uh, now, some of the data transmission we get now with the Blue Force Tracker is, in theory, better than we actually get. I think in my experience, the Blue Force Tracker is not entirely used because the information, actually inputting the information into the computer system takes longer than just getting on the radio and giving a spot rep. Yeah. And that, you know, let somebody else in brigade deal, deal with that. Uh, so is it possible once you have created the 3D, uh, 3D environment that you are now looking around and you get the input from that, the next question is, is it possible to use this 3D world and then put markers and instructions on the 3D world as well? Yeah, that, that would be really, yeah, that, that would make it probably way easier. Because then there's not an error like, okay, you took the, the, you took the wrong tree or something. Yeah. Because like instructions, a machine gunner um, at 300 meters um, next to the second tree or something. And then you just mark there and you fire there. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, this sounds all very fantastical. And we're probably not going to see this in the next two or three years. But if you think about it, the I mean, the technology clearly exists, yeah. and it is merely a matter of refining it, making it small enough, rugged enough. Yeah, rugged is especially uh, that's, that's the big thing, is making it rugged. Because you don't want to break, your system shouldn't break, like, well, when, when windows, <laughs> the green screen of death, because, well, then it will be the green screen of death. Or, or blue black, screen. in this case. Yeah, so black. The, or, or the world goes to black. But... That said, I don't think it's going to be too long before you will see a augmented reality applications like this, certainly at the divisional and higher level command posts. Yeah. I think that's going to happen much sooner. And I, I mean, I've seen uh, maps that are done with LIDAR from satellites, so that the uh, down to less than one square meter okay. in resolution. I, I, I would say at, at the command post level, yes, and it will be used for planning. And it will be used for possibly even further, far down as uh, battalion level. In the vehicles themselves, augmented reality, I think it's going to be a much more limited application. Yeah. I mean, that said, it exists. A heads-up display, 
for an Apache pilot, yeah. that little monocle, that is technically a form of augmented reality. Yeah. Because it, it, it displays a computer-generated image of the crosshair of the, of the gun on top of the real world. Hmm. So it's not actually that much of a step. That's a good point. And you also talked about after-action reports. Yes. How would you use it there? Uh, that would obviously be used in the training environment. I, I don't, in theory, if you happen to have spare UAVs, you could do it in the real world battle, I guess, just to find out what happened. But in, in some place that uh, is always fought over, like the box at NTC, I see no reason why you that can't, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. National Training Center is Fort Irwin, California. Ah, okay. I have spent many, many, uh, much, much time in Fort Irwin, California. Uh, it's in the middle of the Mojave Desert, but it is a national training center where large maneuver warfare is trained. Is this where they have the op for forces? Correct. The ah, 11th ACR. Okay. Yeah. The long black horse. And uh, the box is the actual training area in which all this battle happens. And, it, I mean, it's a very, very big box, but it's only one box. So in theory, you could put cameras and sensors and so on in known positions in the box that would then record the battle visually, 3D, however it's done by LiDAR. And that data could then be used to create a three-dimensional image that you can then fly around. I mean, they track you right now anyway, yeah. but it's a two-dimensional image on a map. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, okay, most of us can read contour lines. We know that's a hill, most likely, yeah. as opposed to a depression, but we, we can see. And if you were able to suddenly 3D around and you realize, Look, that's, this is why you didn't see that artillery piece over there. And it's very, very obvious because there's a hill as opposed to just the contour line on the map. Which, yeah, yeah. Again, you should know, but why make it hard for yourself? Also, I think it probably makes everything fast and easier because at one point you just need to solve it. It, it processes all the information yeah. and then you, you, you have the after action augmented reality situation. And nowadays, you're probably still doing a lot of paperwork. And there is some stuff also that will not appear on the map. A lot of the micro-terrain, that uh, if you're in a, a tiny little draw that's too small to fit on the map, yeah. and you get keyhole shots, wonderful keyhole shots. I've seen, I've seen, what, uh, what is a keyhole shot? A keyhole shot is if, uh, let's say this is a wall, and have a wall here, and all you can see is this narrow ah, okay. gap. So there could be an entire division here but only a couple of tanks at a time can see you. So it's uh, a keyhole shot is tank drives forward, you get shot from the side and nobody else has a clue where the shot came from. Ah, okay. Uh, an augmented reality, a 3D terrain, would be wonderful to show people this is what happened. This is how it happened. Because you, I mean, in theory, you can get in a Humvee and you can go up there and you can see for yourself. Yeah. The reality is that doesn't happen. This, you download it, you can, you can process it at home, back at home station, you go back to Fort Hood or wherever it was you came from, and you can just analyze it flying around the battlefield. Again, we do something similar to that with the simulators. Because what's a simulator today? It's, it's a 3D generated world yeah. that you drive your tanks around. And then when you go into the AAR room, you're all in front of this big, uh, big TV screen, and the guy flies the camera around to show you various things that happen. But you are at the mercy, basically, of what the guy on the TV screen is doing. Yeah. Now you have an iPad, you just set it up yourself in, in, in your barracks or whatever, and you fly it around yourself. Hmm, I wonder if this could be useful for, I mean, for soldiers. But especially, yeah, because, because then also basically every soldier can track himself or his comrades and everything around. So yeah, there, there I see a lot of direct potential that you can exploit. Yeah. So we'll see, but for now it is uh, best used, I think, in uh, video games. So as I say, this is a technology demonstrator that World of Tanks has come up with. Uh, I'm sure that the development guys are working hard at coming up with a, a, a actual real world use for it that uh, where you can see it as outside of this demonstrator version. Uh, as I say, I think for tabletop war games, it's like the next generation yeah. of tabletop war game. Uh, although I love my painting my, all my tanks, it's kind of like, I, I'm dealing with a one to one to three hundred scale T80, and my eyes are yeah. getting old. And for me, it's usually a storage problem already, like where oh, to put where everything put and not getting it damaged, and you dust it off and everything. Yeah. So in that regard, yeah, that is just fits on an iPad or something, and then it works. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. So uh, well, well, I guess we'll see where the uh, where the technology takes us, but uh, I would not be surprised to see it start showing up in the army a lot more a lot sooner than we think it does. Also, know, let us know what you think in the comment section. If you have any questions about it, then we might do a follow-up video or something. Yeah, I'm good with that. 
And then thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And uh, lads, don't forget to check out the link at the bottom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. Speaking about the sponsorship and clicking the link in the description, this will provide new players of World of Tanks with immediate access to the T-127 tank, 500 gold and 7 days of premium time. World of Tanks features over 500 tanks, including the Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger, the T-34, the Sherman, the Matilda and the S-35. Also note that World of Tanks supports various museums and events like Tankfest or the D-Day event in Coney, Ohio, where this video and many others were recorded. Big thank you here to Matt for filming us during our talk, Aman for providing visual security and Ryan for setting up the augmented reality system, which allowed to turn this video into a far better experience for you. As always, source a link in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.